As the country recovers from the troubles of the last few years, businesses are looking out to a new landscape, with disruption accelerating an already existing process of digitization. This digital transformation has transformed every industry and business model, leaving organizations facing a growing constellation of challenges that are forcing them to ask themselves thorny questions. From current issues to more novel challenges, success will come to businesses best able to adapt to the crucial questions posed by our growing digital society. In this program, we are hearing from three companies on the forefront of today's digital challenges. Jagger is leading a revolution in procurement technology. Cyberduck are an award-winning digital transformation agency that specializes in helping companies reimagine how they do business online. Reference Point is a global supplier of software solutions at the forefront of training, workforce management and membership community management. So I think there's a number of ways that digital solutions can really improve um, workforces and learner management. And that really harks back to a core part of a lot of the solutions that we deliver, which are have, a, have a, an online database component, but there's also something that the individual carries with them. And that's usually some kind of smart card technology. And that means that they're always carrying the credentials with them, but they can be updated electronically. So, you know, historically, people would often be used to some old ID card that's printed. And as soon as it's printed, then it's out of date. But when you've got smart technology, that's kept current all the time. Digital transformation is business transformation, but with a big focus on the user experience. You put that at the heart of the transformation and that starts before you begin looking at the technology and the other processes involved. Digital transformation is a phenomenon that has impacted all of us and it will continue to play a significant role in how we live our lives and how we engage with products, services and even each other. I think the biggest challenge to the industry right now is the sheer breadth of what they're being asked to do. It is a very different thing today compared to a few years ago that they've been asked to go and deliver to their businesses strategically. So in the past, procurement was a bit of a back office environment. Um, they were looking more around operational cost efficiencies. And yet now, look at what they're trying to do. They're trying to mitigate risk in the supply chain. They're trying to impact upon cybersecurity. They're trying to ensure that environmental and social guidelines are being followed within their supplier base. That is not even thinking about some of the black swan events like Brexit or COVID. Um, or some of the trade wars, or even, God forget, the, Europe, the Ukraine uh, war right now. The impact on raw materials, the hyperinflation, all of these areas are areas that procurement are now being asked to try and address. That's the biggest challenge they have, and quite frankly, they're being asked to do an awful lot more with an awful lot less. So one of the main drivers of digital transformation is connectivity. It's been forecasted by 2025 that there are going to be 30.9 billion devices connected to the internet and this increased connectivity drives choice. And that choice means that businesses have to work harder to retain their customers. Also, globalization breeds fierce competition, but also broader opportunities. And this has been a trend that's been accelerated by COVID-19. And lastly, the interesting thing is that digital transformation actually breeds further digital transformation. It's no longer a nice to have for businesses and it doesn't matter if you are a huge tech giant or a small local greengrocer. Everybody needs to transform. Well, I think the transformative benefits have been really quite considerable, but to, to, I have to start by explaining what we set out to do, which was to create a system where uh, people could simply and safely swipe onto the infrastructure, the 20,000 miles of railway infrastructure, uh, in a way that could authenticate the level of competence they had, whether they had a, a medical check and whether they'd been checked for drugs and al alcohol. So uh, it was to make sure that people could operate as teams uh, day and night on the infrastructure safely. So the Highways Passport's been great for us at Kia. It's probably when we started this journey, one of our biggest challenges was around um, people on site and us being able to really be confident that we're putting them to work safely. So uh, we had systems for managing training, competency and the skills that our workforce had, but they were very back office focused. So when a supervisor went to put their people to work, 
they almost had to take their word for it that they were qualified and competent. Um, so for us, it's been it's been vital uh, from our safety performance, from you know, I guess our sort of transformation of our work of how we manage our workforce to use the passport. It has um, most definitely had a benefit to our supply chain. So you know, I, one of the biggest challenges for us is that this industry has people coming and going all of the time. So um, we have our own direct workforce, but we deliver a lot of our works through our supply chain um, or through agency staff that, that come and work for us. Um, and it's a real challenge sometimes to um, you know, really get to know what qualifications and competencies they have. Um, and also for our supply chain, there's a lot of repetition because they're often coming to work for us one day and then another um, highways contractor another day. Um, and we all ask them to do the same things. And without a single system across the industry, there's no way of knowing what they've done for across you know, different organisations. So it's a real benefit to the supply chain that means that they can do things once and we can all have visibility of that and share those records. Within the procurement world, you know, automation for us is really focusing in on the supplier qualification process at the moment. There's several things we need to check through. We need to check through the supplier's financials, the quality system, the design they've produced, the track record, where they operate, who they're owned by. That really touches almost all of the core functions within our business. And for us, being able to automate that with a tool such as Jagger is really powerful because we can do it through a series of data collection, some of it automated from third parties, some of it going directly to the engineering teams, and it brings back and aggregates into one central repository that we can analyze or we can set automatic evaluation criteria on. When we think about how the, the people in my business that need to procure goods and services, I really want to give them the best and easiest um, buying experience that they can. And a tool like Jagger really moves that buying experience on and away from a fairly horrible, mundane, very traditional interface to one that people are just used to using because in their day-to-day -day lives that's how they're buying things online. It becomes a very similar process to how they buy things in the business. However, with the Jagger tool, we have the ability to put in controls around the types of items they can buy. We can put in place budgetary controls. We can tie costs to cost centers. And that's all done in the background with very little administrative support from my team which allows my team to concentrate on more value-added opportunities. This catalytic effect on organisational processes has in some cases helped companies more easily ride through later disruptions and knock-on effects of recent events. By initially embracing new emerging technologies such as automation and digitisation, they were able to future-proof some of their processes. Putting aside the obvious health, social and economic impact of the virus, external limitations can actually breed creativity and this can lead to the adoption of new and improved ways of doing things and we've seen this during the pandemic. During the pandemic many companies were forced to adopt agile processes so that they could adapt to successive lockdowns but this is a change that will actually serve them well in the future because it will help them adapt to changing customer demands and a changing competitive landscape. Finally, COVID-19 for many businesses has brought about a people-focused culture with the realisation that it's actually people, not offices or systems, that are the driving force behind most businesses. And ultimately, happy people perform better and this leads to companies that perform better too. Another important gain was to allow bigger companies the capacity to act with a manoeuvrability usually reserved for smaller actors in the market. So one of the biggest challenges is that we live in a society where information and choice is plentiful. As a result, it's given rise to the instant gratification economy, which essentially means that we want what we want now, and if a service can't provide that, we'll go elsewhere. In addition to that, we live in a world where our professional self and our personal life are becoming more intertwined. As a result, our values are becoming more important. So we start checking for a brand or an employer's stance on things that relate to our value. For example, anti-racism, inclusion and sustainability. And people can suss out performative actions. So it's not just what a business says, it's their actions too. So for example, what is the carbon footprint of your website? Is your product or service accessible and inclusive? And the challenging thing is, sometimes digital can unwittingly 
negatively impacts those things. So take a website, for example. Having long loading times, multiple sites and embedded video increases your carbon footprint. Likewise, if you had content which was just in PDF format, that can exclude the blind or the visually impaired, as can lifts in your building that have replaced the buttons with touchscreens. So the challenge is to try to strike a balance between technological innovation and being value driven. And it's, but it's critical because what we're finding is people are more willing to vote with their wallets and purchase from businesses and companies that align with their values. In addition to verification and communication improvements, digital systems can be more easily automated with additional efficiency gains. Automation is the key to increasing productivity and ultimately our livelihoods. The transparency and manoeuvrability of digital systems makes it easier than ever. I think a major area for the future will be looking at this more, a focus away from churn, a focus away from, we need more people, to actually saying, how can we use the people we've got better? How can we upskill them? How can we maintain their, their knowledge, their experience, their competency? What other opportunities have we got to use those people more widely if we give them another piece of training or some other piece of learning? So that in the future, um, all of this information is used in a much more managed way. And so it's gonna be not so much about quantity all the time, but very much about quality for people, which is great news for the workforce. It's great news for companies as well. And technology has a really large part to play in that. Let's take a streaming service, for example. They may want to integrate a CRM, a booking system, and an invoicing system into their web app. And then they can even go a step further by looking at artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and conversational UIs like Alexa to enhance the user experience through automation and personalization. To best take advantage of the benefits of automation, businesses must be able to understand and interpret the information that is generated as a result. The digital age has provided an abundance of data which was previously unavailable to organizations. With this volume, it can be difficult to filter out the signal from the noise. In the same way that modern digital tools help to provide a clearer view of our physical environment, AI provides us with a more accurate understanding of the data we collect. Okay, in terms of the role for artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's actually quite hard even to predict that, um, because five years is, for example, using that as an idea is a, is a long, long time. But I think it's, it is going to be about the fact that now, with the vast amount of information that is available, you're going to have to use AI and machine learning to help navigate your way through it. We're seeing that, we're just starting to use it ourselves. And quite often, the AI is coming up with possible trends it may not be right, but it's giving, it's, it's, it's giving you a pointer of where there might be something for you to look at. And it's that, I think, that is going to be really helpful, that otherwise, I think often in industry, people just carry on on the same old path. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, we'll carry on doing it this way. That's how projects have always run. And actually having things like machine learning, which is actually looking at large amounts of data and making different interpretations can be really refreshing and valuable for organisations. So I, I see it as something that's going to become more and more important so that step one will be we need to protect our workforce, make sure they're competent, make sure they're running, working well on projects. And then what are we learning as a result? How can we make those future projects better, more profitable, safer, more effective, all of those other things? Technology can also make the experience more efficient as well by removing repetitive and time consuming tasks. So think one click grocery shopping. But of course, one size doesn't fit all. Personalization technology can help make experiences tailored and delightful for people. So a good example of this is companies like Netflix and Spotify, where they tailor content based on the time of day or even sometimes the mood of the user. And it doesn't stop there. Great UX design and technology can also lead to really inclusive experiences for people. So that's whether you're disabled, neurodiverse, economically marginalized, or not familiar with digital technology. As we learn to harness the power of AI, 
our ability to understand and interpret information in a way that helps us make better decisions increases dramatically. With the pace of change accelerating, this has never been more important. With the right tools and talent, organizations can be insight-driven, letting data take them to the truth rather than trying to impose a pre-existing worldview from above. The opportunities and challenges can be seen then in a clearer light. Among the fearsome challenges businesses face, the turmoil of the last few years has elevated supply chain issues as the biggest threat to the functioning of business. Again, if people are looking at the procurement function and then looking at the data, so artificial intelligence doesn't work unless you have a pool of data for it to analyze, right? That's, that's, the, that's the whole basis of it. But if you have that data, and you can let artificial intelligence learn and use machine learning to go and learn from that data. Again, it's able to almost be your assistant who's by the side of you to say, okay, based on what you've done over the last six months, you should be thinking about doing A, B, C, D, or E. You should be thinking about looking at that supplier over here because there's something they've done you may be interested in. You should think about running a tender because these contracts are running out and expiring at this certain date. So in essence, it becomes a recommendation engine, a person almost sat next to you, who's basically saying, if you do this, this could be the result. So that's going to transform again the procurement professional to automate some of those more transactional things they've been used to in the past. to so allow them to go and be closer to the supplier and have a much more strategic impact to the business. In recent times, supply chains have been exposed as being highly vulnerable to disruption. The efficiency of these networks is fundamental to the success of any business. If one link in the chain breaks, the entire system fails. When the pandemic first appeared, it was really clear to myself and to the rest of the leadership team that we needed to act quickly to make sure our supply chains were sustainable and to make sure that we started to understand where the risks lay. And some of the, the great tools that are now around for procurement organisations meant that that was a much less complicated task than it would have been, say, even three years ago. So we were quite quickly able to correlate the data within our ERP system on the location of our suppliers with the incidence of COVID emerging in Italy. For us, this was particularly important as we have three manufacturing sites in Italy. And we repeated that method as we went forward, as the pandemic spread around the world, we were able to look at where the pandemic was moving and how it was connecting with our supply base to really try and stay in touch with how we deployed our limited resources to make sure we understood the complex situations as quickly as possible. And that then fed through on how we tracked the performance of our suppliers. So we were able to say this supplier in, in particular is in a heavily affected area. We were able to look at delivery performance and correlate that to the suppliers that were use that as a point of correlation to understand whether suppliers in affected areas were still performing well. Clearly Brexit has completely changed the way that we export goods and services from the UK and many of the trains that we manufacture in the UK are crossing borders. It also changed the way that I import key systems that go onto the trains here. So many of my systems are crossing the UK border multiple times. And so we've had to put in place new processes that allow us to record goods as they come in and out of the UK, which we didn't have to do under EU uh, trade law. And the technology has really allowed us to do that in a very efficient and cost-effective way. What do the future requirements of procurement look like? I think they're going to be after something which is going to be networked. So talking about those buyers, the enterprise buyers, suppliers, partners, they need to have that networked access for one cloud, Give me access to this. So we want to ensure that the suppliers and the partners and the, and the, business, um, the business buyers are transacting in a similar way that we're used to in the B2C world. That's the first thing. Secondly, it has to be intelligent. They have to be able to utilize artificial intelligence, machine learning. If you can't do that, you're not justifying how you're actually enabling this, this whole technology platform. It's used in other areas of business. Why isn't it being used in the procurement function? Right. Secondly, it's got to be comprehensive. It needs to ensure that you have the right breadth of functionality going through the, the source to pay cycle. You know, that's really important. It needs to have the right, uh, the right functionality. Um, and then the final point, I guess, is it's got to be extensible. And what I mean by extensible is 
there's a massive, vast ecosystem of suppliers out there. Yeah. Being able to grab data, which no one vendor can do, but being able to go to different vendors who have that information, whether it's around supply risk or whether it's around sustainability or whether it's around um, you know, how the suppliers are engaging with particular product sets, it is out there, but it's held in different pockets of other vendors. It's an ecosystem. So what procurement are going to be asking for is, look, I want something which is going to be connected to that, connected to that, connected to that, connected to that, but I want one platform that I'm going to view that from. Digital technology has now enabled us to monitor these networks in real time, providing a more resilient system. But it is a reinforcing process. The challenges spur innovation, which then works to solve further issues. The procurement function loses the majority of its time by trying to collate data. Whether that data is on a paper or a contract stuffed in a drawer or whether it's in a file format somewhere, there is a multitude of data across the enterprise that is very, very difficult to collate and takes weeks, sometimes months to collate and then present. Of course, it's out of date by then anyway. So I think if you look at what the procurement function again can do, if you can start collating that data more effectively, it's going to free up so much of their time because without doubt, collating data from different systems across the different enterprises globally takes up more time than anything else. You need to map your supply network. You need to get visibility across your supply chain to be able to ensure that if you do plan ahead, if there's an issue, if there's a problem, what do you do in terms of an alternate sourcing strategy? Uh, the people who actually survive very well in terms of the COVID impact from a business perspective were those who mapped their supply network effectively. And they did that because they had transparency across their supply data through their supply chain and they were able to map that effectively. So really it is around transparency, it is around collating data and ensuring you have that visibility across your business. That enables you to make decisions quickly and be able to react faster and that keeps you in business. The digital revolution has changed the way we work and live. With the sophistication of the data analysis allowing companies to be nimbler and more flexible than ever. This flexibility has many applications, one being to reorient the design process around the needs of the user. Data analytics is a really big growth area and it's actually one which is growing absolutely exponentially right now, partly as a result of new technology becoming available that enables organisations to drill down into swathes of information in a very incisive way. So thinking again about the kind of systems and platforms that we use, we are collecting very, very large amounts of information about learners, workforces, projects, and so forth. Data and analytics, I mean, it's, it's one of the most important things in the world right now, it's the future. Um, we have so much intelligent software out there that's gathering so much information and it essentially allows really, really big organisations to start acting like small ones because they can really know their workforce, they can really know their customers, they can really know all the delegates that they're training if you're in the training industry and they can understand what the opportunities are across all of those areas, they can see um, things like sustainability as well. They can also improve their sales by forecasting for all of those things. So data offers so much value to everybody if it can be analyzed in the right way. And something that's coming up really soon is the use of artificial intelligence to look at that information. Because particularly where we have systems that are you know, across an entire industry, nationally or internationally, there's so much information there that no human being could ever really analyse all of that. You know, it would take years for them to just gather one singular useful bit of information. Whereas artificial intelligence can look across all of that and start making analysis and give us insight into things that we would never have been able to have insight in before. So a really good example of this is in relation to the construction industry specifically, although it does affect other industries like pharma as well. Um, and also the food industry is really affected by this at the moment, which is a skills shortage. One new opportunity is in designing more people-friendly products. Digital products have grown to be increasingly complex, requiring a different approach to design. We are seeing new approaches such as user-centric design, which focuses on the user journey, rather than solely on what features a product can offer.
The starting point, the starting point for any successful uh, digital transformation is a focus on what your users need and the art of imagining what's possible through user-centered innovation. TED is a great example of this. They realized that their users wanted more content, but their format made it really hard to meet this demand. So to do this, they needed a global digital platform that allowed others to create their own TED events, uh, helping them grow exponentially. The starting place for, for this was not the technology in itself, but the insight into user needs. Digital is responsible for 2% of all global carbon emissions, and this is more than aviation. Considered UX design and technology can play their part in helping reduce carbon emissions by making customer experiences so great that people find what they need much faster, reducing um, loading times, reducing the amount of time people spend browsing. We can all play our part in helping save our planet. The upshot is that this is enabling organizations to create products that are more intuitive and accessible for end users. But it is only the first step to our new personalized digital future. So to deliver on these user needs through uh, user-centric innovation, it requires five things. So the first is a brand strategy. So a clearly defined brand purpose with laser sharp focus on what your users need and creative ways to deliver these. The second is a user centric culture that facilitates this innovation. So this can require training and internal communications to roll out the brand purpose um, and possibly even upskilling teams on new ways of doing things. The third is data. So qualitative research data and connected quantitative data is quite critical in, in uncovering those user needs as well. The fourth is people. So to deliver and um, to deliver this use uh, this transformation, you need dedicated resources senior enough to make this change happen. So this could be a chief CX officer. Uh, we've seen that often without this, the digital transformation can, can really fail. In addition to user centricity, a successful culture in a digital organization also includes lean and agile methodologies, where organizations research, prototype, and test what they do. And if they fail, they fail fast, they learn from the data, and they then improve. And this is critical to digital transformation. Successful businesses, more than ever, must keep one eye on the future. The economy has changed dramatically over the past decade. Now, the majority of jobs require at least some digital skills, and those without these can find themselves struggling to get ahead. The future of digitization looks bright, with experts predicting that machines will soon be able to take on tasks that previously required human intelligence. However, for now, there is still plenty of room for humans to continue to thrive in the workplace. Whether it's working alongside the robots or creating entirely new opportunities, the next few decades could see dramatic changes that will have huge implications for the way we live our lives.